inviting me to give this talk and thank you for giving me the opportunity and freedom to talk about something that I like. <laughs> um, this is, a, I'm going to be talking about um, um, eye tracking um, and the, the technique of eye tracking that we use in different cognitive science. Uh, sciences. So I am a linguist who works in, uh, in the field of psycho and neurolinguistics. So my focus is on, on, on research in language, uh, uh, language is a cognitive system. And in researching language, uh, we get to use a lot of techniques that are actually borrowed from another, from other sciences, such as neuroscience and psychology. And through studying language, we get to know a lot of things uh, that are not strictly speaking language, uh, a lot of things that uh, have to do with cognition in general and with how our brain actually works. Uh, because language is just one of the cognitive uh, mechanisms, one of the cognitive features uh, of our brains, but it is based. Um, it has its, uh, let's say, physical reality. Language is either spoken or written. So in order to understand or use language, uh, we have to learn about other uh, uh, brain functions and other cognitive functions such as perception, right? Uh, so I will be talking about how we actually do this, how we use what we know about our eyes and about our visual system to know something about the cognitive system, uh, more, more, more specifically brain. And uh, I will be talking about then later, those are the other realities that Dr. Lambert mentioned, how we use then the knowledge from uh, uh, what we know about how uh, uh, we research language through eye tracking, how we use it for some other fields that are not connected to language, uh, how we use it to know something about our brains and our mind. Um, so the outline of the, let me see. Okay, the outline for, for today's uh, lecture will be as follows. Uh, in the first part, it will be the biggest and the longest because this is what I do um, and what I know most about. And we will be talking about vision in general, how our vision works uh, uh, and with eye movements in typical adults, right? And we'll be talking about the characteristics of the visual system, of the reading, because this is what I do my research mostly on, and characteristics of scene perception. So not looking at language material, but generally scenes, right? Uh, images. Then I will move on to something that I, I, I it's not my area of, of, of expertise, but is definitely very closely related. And this is vision and eye movement in atypical population. So how we can use eye movements in clinical settings, right, to know something about how uh, uh, people might, people who are atypically developing, uh, how their movements are functioning, um, and which uh, disorders and which atypical populations uh, we already have research on and already know something about. And then at the end, in the last part, I will move on, move to business. Uh, and this is basically something that is nowadays a very um, um, interesting field, I would say, both of research, but also of application of the research. And this is how we can use eye movements using all the same principles that are used in, you know, basic research, such as, you know, reading in typical adults, how we can use that uh, in business and more specifically in marketing uh, to know something about um, how customers and how users are behaving and based on that to maybe adapt our advertising strategies or business plans, right? Uh, so as I said, we start with the basis. We start with, you know, describing how eye movements work in typical adults and how we do research on it. So vision and eye movements in typical adults. Uh, the vision, our vision system works in such a way that we have uh, uh, our eyes connected to our brains through optical nerves. Uh, the vision is binocular, right? Usually, typically. Um, and in order for the image uh, to get to our brains, actually to be decoded by our brains, 
there are a lot of different neurons that are taking part in this and a lot of different functions. In principle, the light, uh, which is the basis of everything, reaches a spe specific types of photoreceptors in the retina, uh, which is in our eyes. If you look at this image here, the retina, so this is the pupil, like the front part of the eyes. This is the retina, but the fovea is only one part of it. Different kinds of these photoreceptors, which are specialized neurons to catch the signal, right? Different kinds are in retina and different kinds are in fovea. In fovea, we have the so-called cones and in the retina, the rods. So because of this, uh, the retina receives much less detailed information than the fovea. Uh, because the cones are those that translate and receive the, the detailed information. And because of that, uh, the, the reading and the detailed information is mostly happening in the foveal, something that we call foveal vision, right? So thanks to these photoreceptors, both rods and cones, uh, these, uh, the electric signals are sent to higher centers in the brain, we call them the higher centers, right? Through this optic nerve that connects the eyes and the brain, uh, uh, in the opposite fashion, uh, for further processing necessary for perception. So at this point, we just have some basic information sent, and then later in the brain, uh, the, the cells that work in the brain and the functions that happen in the brain and the mechanisms are actually enabling us to know what we are seeing, right? Um, half of the information carried through this optic nerve is from the fovea, as I said, the majority of it, the most important. Other, other uh, photoreceptors in the retina also send that information, but approximately half of it is from the fovea. This is the most precise one, and this is the one that we need for reading. Um, so because of this, because of this differences in how the nerves are distributed in our eye and what kind of information they can send to the brain, we have different kinds of, let's say, um, uh, acuity of, of, of vision. So we have the foveal region, which is within one degree of visual angle to other side of the fixation point. I will talk about what fixation is. So in terms of reading, that is three to four characters left to right. This is our foveal vision, the most precise one. Then we have parafoveal vision, which is another approximately five degrees to either side of the fixation point. And then we have peripheral, per peripheral region, which is beyond the parafoveal, right? In this region, we cannot even extract, for example, when we talk about uh, very uh, uh, detailed information such as text, in this peripheral region, we can only get the general gist, the general shape of the text, right? We cannot even detect the letters. Now, these are the regions of vision, but on the top of it, we have something that is called perceptual span. This is the, the field of effective vision, and this is based, so this is, foveal, parafoveal, peripheral, what we can do, right? What a visual system can do. On top of that, we have what, how we direct our attention. Um, and this is our perceptual span. And the, this depends on our knowledge and on how we learn to see the world around us, right? And this is, when it comes to reading, asymmetric. Uh, depending on how we are reading, whether we are reading to the left or to the right, right? There are different uh, writing systems, right? And we have over the years learned how to direct our attention. Uh, so our perceptual span is asymmetric around the fixation location. And the perceptual span is the actual amount of visual information that is being processed when we fixate uh, while reading, right? So as I said, we have foveal, parafoveal, peripheral. This is basically what our system can do. And then on top of that is what we actually, the information that we actually process from that, and that's asymmetric. So this is how it would look like. If we fo fixate on the word he, uh, uh, the next several characters would be parafoveally seen. And then after that, we don't even, we don't even see, uh, we don't extract. And we would see a little bit to the left too. Uh, now, eye movements in reading, when we read texts, we don't read smoothly. People maybe sometimes think 
that when we read text, we fixate and we look at every letter, at every character, but this is not the case. Um, this is not a smooth process, but we call it the squirrel jumps, the squirrel jumps that we are doing. So we would, for example, if you look at this example of the text here, the circles are indicating where you fixate, where you look at the text. So you don't, you sometimes even skip the entire word, for example, this word, ok, here. Uh, we fixate, we jump from one part of the word to another. Um, and while we are fixating, we spend there two, three hundred milliseconds. And in that point, we extract the information. Then we jump. We extract information foveally, paraphobially a little bit. We jump to the next part, etc. So reading actually consists of fixations, which is when we stay on one character usually, and saccades, which are these jumps uh, from one point to another. So the entire visual field is not processed with a single fixation because we are very uh, um, limited with how much we see with a single fixation. We move our eyes to be able to grasp information. This is actually what eye movements are for. We move our eyes in order to extract information because with one look, with one fixation, we cannot extract everything. So, if it weren't for the eye movements, we wouldn't be able to fully process the information outside of the foveal vision. And if you remember, foveal vision is three to four characters in reading. So, this is really little, um, not a lot. So, we need to move our eyes. And it is from this basic assumption that we move our eyes to process information. The assumption is that we will move it also in a way that optimizes uh, optimizes the information extraction, right? This is very important later for marketing. I will go back to this. So fixations are when eyes stop scanning the scene and stay on the same letter, for example, in the, in the case of reading, or some point of the image, if we're talking about looking at images and scenes. But what is important for the research and for later application of that research is that the length how long you stay in one spot depends on a lot of factors. First of all, what you're looking at. So the stimuli, we, I will call the stimuli either the text or the image that you're looking at. This, de this determines how long you will be looking at it at each point, but also the type of the task, right? Why you are looking at it, the reason uh, uh, for which you are extracting information. Uh, we know that, for example, in reading, the fixation duration can depend on whether you are reading uh, silently. Uh, fixations are 2 to 250 milliseconds. So this is very, very short. We don't... So when you see something presented on the screen for 250 milliseconds, you're not even aware you saw it. So the fixations, we are not aware of how many times we actually stopped. For example, if we are reading one word, we don't know, we are not aware of how many times we jumped from one part of the word to another to fixate and to maybe read or reread. So this is all very fast. In oral reading, it's a little bit, the fixations are a little bit longer. So how do we measure eye tracking during reading? This is a, uh, this is a picture from one of the experiments I did. This is me taking the picture of the screen. So what we do is we have these eye tracking machines uh, where, uh, which are basically very, very precise, fancy cameras. They use uh, infrared light to basically measure and capture the pupil. And then based on that, we can see, because this is telling us where the fovea is, and based on that, we can see where the person is fixating uh, during the reading. So the person would be sitting in a, in a lab looking at the screen. Usually in the screen you have either text or the image, depending on what you want to look at. We usually tell them not to move and sometimes we even give them this chin rest to make sure that they're not moving too much because we don't want the camera to lose their eye uh, once we do the calibration. 
And then in the experimental computer, we can track. As you can see, this blue circle here is what the person fixated at that moment. We can track, then we record all that, and then we do the analysis. We can compare uh, where they're fixated more, how many times they jumped, etc. And I will talk about why this is all informative. So perceptual span in reading, as I said, perceptual span is the size of the effective visual field from which information is extracted. And this depends on our knowledge. So not, not on what eyes can do, but what eyes can do plus what we learned, what we taught them to do over the years. Uh, so the size of the, the perceptual span is subject to proficiency. So what this means that skilled readers have bigger span, can see, extract from information from more characters at one fixation, right? So they are more effective in a way. But skilled readers also, because of that, because they have can extract more information at one fixation, they will do fewer saccades, right? They will jump less. But then it's also subject to cross-linguistic -ling variation, as I said. So in English, we know um, that the perceptual span is three to four spaces or characters to the left and up to 15 to the right of the fixation, right? In English. In Chinese, where we have characters, is one character to the left and two, three to the right, right? Because the characters are much more informative, you need more time to extract information from them. Both English and Chinese are left to right writing systems, right? But then if you have Hebrew, which is right to left, the perceptual span is different. So you would have more characters to the left than to the right, because over the years when we learn how to read, we train our, our visual field to extract our perception, to extract information in such a way. But so these are the so-called top-down characteristics, our knowledge, but there are a lot of bottom up. So the characteristics of, of the stimuli of what we are seeing. And those are very simple things such as uh, the reading material difficulty, right? If the letters are not visible, this will decrease our uh, uh, perceptual span. This is why when we do experiments, for example, we always have very easily readable fonts such as Arial, Times New Roman, and it's always black and white. And uh, this is that way you don't uh, introduce any difficulty. This low level um, uh, visual information uh, is a crucial factor to determine where we not consciously move our eyes where a saccade lands. So the more visible or more salient the text is, the longer the saccade. Uh, spacing between words in reading can also determine where we land, etc. And what we know also generally is that readers tend to make the first fixation somewhere, somewhere between the beginning and the middle of the word. Um, but then there are other, I won't stay in this too much, but there are a lot of factors about our knowledge of language, if we're talking about reading, a lot of factors that have to do with our knowledge of language that affect how long we stay on one word, such as the frequency of the word, how often do you use that word, the word length, how predictable the word is in, the, in this particular context. How many meanings, it is, a, is it a word with many meanings or just one? So is it ambiguous or not? Uh, when you acquire this word, uh, semantic relations, whether it's related to other words that we also saw, how familiar you are with that word, et cetera, et cetera. All this subconscious, right? We don't, we don't control this. This is, this is something about our knowledge of language that determines eye movement. And this is how it looks like basically when somebody would read one sentence, right? Uh, they would fixate always on the first word. That's very salient, the first word in the sentence, then jump to the next, then to the next, then usually the, his, on those small words you skip because you see them paraphobially. 
but then the person came to the word windmill. Now, if you actually read a sentence, it is semantically weird. The knight attacked the windmill, <laughs> right? So you usually don't attack the windmill. This is why this person that was reading this sentence fixated several times, went back to the verb. So did the backward regression, saccade, to go back to the verb, uh, uh, the windmill, who did what to windmill to figure out what is happening and then go back, went back to the windmill and to the end of the sentence. This is all happening subconsciously. What the person was probably realizing consciously reading the sentence is that something was weird, but, but the number of the saccades and the exact locations of the fixations are subconscious. Now, if we move on from text to images, visual perception research um, really depends a lot on what we are doing. So if we would give in research uh, a di different task, the person would do different things with the same image, right? So this is, for example, on the, on the left, uh, uh, where, uh, uh, um, an experiment where we say, look for a cactus. When you say, look for it, and you put the images in the circle, the person nicely goes in the circle. When you give them a, a picture, let's say a naturalistic looking photograph or something like that, uh, if you give them different kinds of tasks, they will do the search differently. If you tell them, look for something and, or, or, and memorize everything around, they will be much more precise. But if you tell them, just look for, I don't know what the task was here, a, a, of a painting, right? They will just do a quick search and their fixations will be much shorter. So where do we look and why in a scene? Uh, again, as with text, they're bottom up and top down. Stimulus salience, the salience of a picture. And in pictures, this is very important, color, contrast orientation of the images on the on the on the screen whether something is moving or not this all affects the location of a fixation but also the top down right the knowledge of the task so the person that is looking can be again subconsciously affected by the task, as I said, what actually I'm doing, but also the knowledge, whether I'm familiar with these objects, whether this is something new for me, etc. So these two things, when we have a scene, collaborate together. And we will see later in marketing research how that is important. Um, okay. So the bottom-up information is very important for scene perception because, um, as I said, colors, shape, orientation are very important, especially colors. And let's say the density of the information, right? So empty, uniform scenes are uninformative. If you look at this photographs, I hope you can see the red dots on it. These are the fixations, right? So this is this picture was given to somebody and fixations were recorded. If you look at the grass, this is not even fixated one because this is uninformative. It's all the same. There is no change. So the person is not fixating on the areas of the picture that are not changing. They are not introducing any new information. Also these areas, right? But if we see the, the, the table with a small object, there are a lot of fixations around it. Um, and uh, so this is where people fixate. So they concentrate their fixations on, let's say, interesting scenes. Um, the average fixation seen in perception is about 300 milliseconds and in visual search 200. As I said, it depends on the task. And factors that can increase the duration are whether it's black or white or color, the task, and whether the objects are consistent or inconsistent, right? So this is basically all uh, I already said. So why do we then, based on everything now, why do we say that the eyes uh, can tell us something about the mind. Given well, given that the the eye movements are so sensitive to this different bottom up, the bottom up uh, being those characteristics of the stimuli. So in in text, the 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 visibility of the text, the font, the orientation, the light, and top down uh, factors such as our knowledge or the task. Um, 
our knowledge in terms of tasks, whether we know the words, whether the words make sense, whether we're familiar with them, whether they're frequent words. Uh, and in terms of scenes is whether the scene is something that is familiar to us or completely new. This all affects how long we fixate on something on the screen. That means that they are very, very informative about our minds and our knowledge. Um, why? Because longer fixations or longer uh, or more frequent mean, or in terms of text, more backwards, okay? It's like in that uh, sentence with uh, 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 the knight attacking the windmill. That means that the brain needs more processing. So this is how the eyes are informative about what brains are doing, what our mind needs. So more fixations mere, mean more processing for the brain because something is harder to process, right? Either because it's harder can mean more informative, right? Either I have more information to process or it is unexpected for me. It is unusual. I don't know it. It is unknown, right? So based on that, we can do, we can find out what for our minds is harder, less known, uh, less informative, um, or more, let's say, more default, more or less default, right? And this information can be useful for many fields. And most importantly, I mean, you can ask a person, but, but and the person will tell you, but this will be a very subjective answer. The good thing about the eye tracking is this is all automatic and this is all subconscious, right? So we get the sub the information about the something that is subconsciously harder, subconsciously more informative, etc. Um, now, this was all uh, eye movements in difficult population and all the knowledge that we have from eye tracking in the last several decades, well, the majority of it is based on typical population, right? Uh, but now the question is, how can we apply this? How can this be useful, uh, for example, in the clinical context? But of course, in order to know how to apply it in a clinical context, we needed to know um, um, how things work with a typical population. So let's see a little bit about how vision and eye movements, um, what we do about them in atypical population. So this is based on all the characteristics of the visual system and of eye movements that I, uh, that I mentioned. So when researchers do these studies, they measure all these things, the, the angle, the, the 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 length of the fixation, the length of the saccade, the number of the saccade, etc. So, as um, as this researcher stated in in this overview in the two thousand and eight paper, our eyes can reveal a great deal about what we are thinking and feeling. I'm not talking about feelings in this talk, but that's all a, a different topic. Uh, and eye tracking measures can uh, harness this potential to improve our understanding of the mind and its development. So I will talk about the development of eye movements here. That means that this research is done mostly on atypical population, which is children. And with children, uh, one, let's say, technical difference or difficulty is that you cannot really tell them don't move <laughs> when even when you're doing research. So we have all different kinds of eye trackers that are developed to make this a little bit easier. For example, the head mounted eye trackers that you can see here that you just put um, on the head and that are not then um, the data is not worse if, if the kids are moving their heads. Um, just to say here that eye tracking is done also with the babies uh, as early as four to six months, uh, in which case, obviously, because you cannot put anything on a baby's head, it will be impossible. Uh, certain uh, eye tracking techniques are developed where you just put a sticker on a baby's uh, forehead, the baby sits in the mother's lap, and then the camera is calibrated to track um, the sticker and to calculate where the eye is relative to the sticker, uh, in which case the experiments are much simpler and shorter, of course, but we can actually do eye tracking research as early as, you know, uh, several months of age. Um, 
And so far, what people have found is that eye tracking can be indicative of certain um, uh, ati of atypical uh, uh, development you know, on certain aspects. Uh, for example, in schizophrenia, uh, it was found across many studies. I have only here uh, stated one, but it has found that particularly one type of eye movement, which is called the sm smooth pursuit type movements. Uh, so here the fixations are shorter and the saccades are shorter. Uh, this type of smooth pursuit eye movement is shown to be impaired. It's shown to be different in schizophrenia, um, uh, with saccades being different and fixations being different than in typical population. And this has been shown across the studies. Also, in ADHD, um, when you give a task such as visual search, uh, if you remember the picture with the with a room and the painting on it, this is called visual search, find something right on the picture. It has been found that in comparison to the typical population, um, uh, the children with ADHD initiate the visual search later. So there is a delay um, in their uh, visual search. Uh, as you can see, uh, for a lot of these uh, atypical uh, uh, eye movements, uh, there is one important aspect here, and that is attention, right? Because eye movements are basically directing the attention uh, out automatically and subconsciously. We can use it, and it can be very useful to detect uh, um, if a person potentially might have any attention, any sorts of attention deficits, right? Uh, it was this this technique has been particularly useful and and investigated in autism spectrum disorders and dyslexia. Autism spectrum disorders, uh, which were called pervasive developmental disorders, a lot of research has been done to show that uh, the, the children with autism in the autism spectrum disorder show different kinds of fixations, but not for all pictures, not for all stimuli. Usually, the stimuli that has to do with, uh, for example, faces of people, um, especially on the eyes. So they, they have shown, uh, several studies have shown, uh, that the fixations on face pictures differ uh, than uh, of the typically developing children in such a way that, also, that uh, 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 autism spectrum disorders, children make fewer fixation on eyes which is usually where you fixate the most. If you see a picture of a face, uh, typically developing children will look at the eyes mostly. Uh, well, autism spectrum disorder significantly, uh, children with it significantly move their fixations to mouth and other parts of the face. Um, also in general, their reading is shown to be slow, slowed down a little bit, that the fixations are a bit longer and they do more backward fixations, so more rereadings. Um, and this is interesting because uh, both for uh, schizophrenia, ADHD and autism spectrum disorders, these are, these are not disorders that are particular to language, but still we can use eye tracking techniques with images or different kinds of materials, but also reading uh, to show differences. But then when it comes to uh, learning and reading difficulties such as dyslexia, which is language specific, right? Uh, uh, which is a uh, yeah, reading difficulty basically. Uh, it has been shown that children with dyslexia may have completely different, well not completely, significantly different reading patterns um, they make more forward saccades, their saccades are shorter, uh, but their fixations are longer and more frequent. Um, and in different uh, visual search tasks, they process fewer letters, right? Um, so, uh, okay, the question is, uh, yes, you have shown that there are differences between these people. Okay, but why is this useful to show that they are different? Well, it is useful because we can use eye tracking for detection, right? Um, so actually a lot of these studies that I showed here, especially uh, with autism spectrum disorders, are not done or are done also with the children that are at risk of developing autism spectrum disorder, not only with the children that, that 
have been diagnosed, right? So what you can do is use eye tracking. This means that we could use eye tracking for early detection of, of, of if we know the eye tracking profiles of different kinds of uh, uh, atypical populations, we can use it to early detect these kinds of disorder. And we know that early detection in any kind of disorder uh, means uh, better prognosis for uh, uh, treatment. And you can see that there are already papers from many years ago that suggest that, that, that uh, eye tracking should be used as screening method for dyslexia, right, to determine uh, whether people are at risk or not, because for now, officially, in majority of the countries, we have certain tests that children at school do um, that can detect uh, whether whether somebody has dyslexia or might potentially develop it. Uh, but actually, eye tracking is might be more efficient way or more informative way uh, of doing it, and not just detection, but also intervention. As I said, not my area of expertise, but there are already studies that even, and this is for now um, for children with ADHD, uh, that use eye tracking as a method uh, uh, to train inhibitory control um, and let's say attention, loosely speaking, uh, so that uh, uh, to help children with ADHD, let's say, re retain their focus a little bit longer. So maybe eye tracking can be used as an intervention tool too. Okay, so this was the use of eye tracking uh, in settings that are more, um, uh, that have to do with research more and then we have to do with, with clinical settings. And then in the last part, I wanted to make it a little bit more, let's say applied uh, in terms of business uh, and to show how we can use eye movement as a business tool, again, based on all the knowledge that we know from research. And this will have to do mostly with uh, those things that I was saying about the bottom-down characteristics of the image, such as color, contrast, shape, orientation, whether something is moving on the screen, etc. how we know that that affects fixations. And the top down and this is our knowledge uh whether something is informative or not for us whether something is new whether something is default whether something is interesting right so the whole idea of using eye tracking in business is basically for marketing purposes and the idea is the more informative something is the more i'm going to look at it automatically right um and so this is why uh, eye movements have been used to investigate consumer behavior and consumer preferences a lot, especially in the internet era, right? So we can analyze how people look at products, how people look at advertisements, how people look at websites. And based on the insights from these uh, fixation patterns, brands and companies can actually optimize uh, their brand performance. This includes whether they will change their website, advertisement, packaging, and how they distribute uh, the product. So for example, um, uh, eye tracking have been used a lot in advertisement testing, right? To see which elements of an advertisement, be it a poster, a banner on a website, etc., cetera, um, billboard, uh, catch attention and which don't, and in what order. And if you can see here, fixations are presented as so-called heat maps. Uh, the red means longer looks and, you know, the greener, the shorter looks, right? And usually these things are done by, um, let's say, hiring a group of, of consumers and uh, giving them a camera to either put on their um, head or simply uh, on the on the on the corner in the corner of the of the computer screen and nowadays we have very cheap eye trackers that are not so let's say precise don't give such a precise information as what we use for for example language research but it can well be informative about things like this so not just where you look more but what the order of fixation is so if you could look at this um, lower commercial here on the left you can see the heat map for this um, ad, 
But then on the right, you can see the order of fixations. So how the fixations went from first uh, on, uh, fixating on the left, then to the top, and then to the right. Uh, and this is very informative for, you know, so that people can know where to put information in an ad, uh, the information that they don't want to be missed, right? And uh, what people also do is uh, put the eye trackers on consumers and let them go into a supermarket. Uh, this is very informative to know um, which position on the shelf in a supermarket catches their attention and which doesn't. And actually, uh, in the big supermarket chains, uh, you have to pay extra. Actually, sometimes if you want your product to be on a shelf that is around this height, because this is where people fixate the most. If you want to put some kind of commercial, one of these that are uh, popping up uh, from the from the shelves, this is all paid extra because research has shown that this is where people look. And if people look somewhere, they will take their product and buy that product more readily than uh, a product that they don't pay attention to, right? Especially if they're in a hurry. But also for the packaging, which is very important in graphic design and in the product design, you could use eye tracking to tell you which parts of the packaging catch attention and which don't, right? So obviously uh, aesthetics is another, another uh, uh, um, important factor with packaging, but, um, it is very important for a designer to know what will be looked at and what not, right? And then you can optimize. And finally, the website. Uh, if you could look at here, I mean, this is just a, a Google search on how to make a pizza, right? Uh, and you can see that the heat map is basically people will look at first two to three uh, results. And pretty much the the... The separate ad on the this is usually an ad on the on the on the on Google on the right. If you remember when I was talking about what we know from scene perception research, people don't look at uninformative, so the picture of the grass and the table. Uh, so people won't look at the at something that is uninformative that doesn't change a lot. Uh, people weren't uh, fixating a lot on the grass. Same way they won't fixate and look a lot at the at the white screen so what people know from <clears throat> research on perception is use white space and you they use this for for advertisement use white space wisely right so people won't look at the white space but if there is something in the middle of a white space people will look at it for sure right so these are all insights that we have from research or if you look at this banner here you can see the heat ma heat maps uh how people look at this a little circle that says no fees. You can see here the heat, heat map. This is the most fixated part of this website. Part of it is because it's in red color. Color is very, very important. So, and because it creates a very big contract in comparison to the other things. If you look at the left upper left corner, this is the logo of the company. People were reading the the name of the company, but not the logo that much because it's a known information. They know which company's website they're looking at. And this is the top down information that we know. People, If something is new, they will look at it. If something is not new and I already know it, people don't fixate on it. So this is all a useful info. Um, but people fixated on uh, uh, you know, parts of the, of the, of the banner with a lot of info, uh, with a lot of different small details, uh, phone number, etc. So this is how we can use these. And what is interesting about it, as I saw, this is all automatic. So you want to adapt your advertising strategies, uh, based on how people, you know, something that people cannot help. <laughs> they cannot help looking at something that attracts their their uh, uh, attention. Uh, so this is how we can use eye tracking to uh, adapt uh, to adapt our business strategies and to maybe uh, custom make uh, the, the 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 ads and the products so that they are more um, more catchy, right? And this is where I would uh, end for today. Uh...